The COVID-19 pandemic hasn't been good for China's Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs said the virus seriously affected one-fifth of the projects. Now, version two of the Belt and Road is emerging. China's digital Silk Road, I think, is only accelerating in the developing world, where the demand for these systems has risen in the aftermath of the pandemic. China has donated vaccines everywhere for the poor countries. Journey with us across the world to discover how the Belt and Road Initiative is evolving in this post-pandemic world. In this episode, the emergence of a health silk road to fight the pandemic. The BRI vaccine partnership, which at launch is 29 countries. The goal of this exercise is to provide adequate manufacturing to produce the needs of the country by the end of 2022. But the health silk road contends with misinformation. This message from anonymous Indonesia. Sinophobia. They try to promote these conspiracy theories that the Chinese have this hostile intention to somehow just sell this second-rate Chinese-made vaccine. And questions about the efficacy of Chinese vaccines. In the pandemic, China's pharmaceutical industry has gone from a non-player in the global stage to an international biotech leader. Chinese pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to come out of this in a pretty strong position, suddenly with a kind of a global share that they wouldn't have had without COVID. How will the Health Silk Road contribute to this battle with COVID-19? And we begin in Italy this morning, where the entire country has been put into lockdown to stem the spread of COVID-19 amid a sharp increase in cases. Another 475 deaths there have been recorded. That's the worst toll in any country in a single day. The hospital system really is at breaking point. As Italy's healthcare system collapses in the pandemic, China steps in. In a phone call with the Italian president, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledges that China is willing to work with Italy to contribute to international cooperation in combating the epidemic and to the construction of a health silk road. And this was how the term health silk road entered the international lexicon. Following the phone call, China sent medical expert teams and emergency medical supplies. Con la Belt and Road Initiative che che è quella di aver dato comunque un filo conduttore sotto il profilo umanitario, no, di aiuti, di sostegno allo sviluppo. Quanto quanto sia importante sentire che se l'altro non è al sicuro io non sono al sicuro e quindi ci dobbiamo preoccupare l'uno dell'altro eh, a livello globale. Non eravamo eh, un cinese, un italiano che stanno insieme, ma eravamo due esseri umani che dovevano risolvere insieme un problema molto difficile. Though the Health Silk Road was coined in 2015, the pandemic was the first time the world started to pay attention. Henry Tillman is a China expert who authored a report titled Health Silk Road 2020. This report was written together with the Shanghai Institutes for International Studies, which is a government-affiliated think tank. It's a five-pronged strategy. Chinese medicine, uh, Chinese um, healthcare professionals, and ultimately, now instead of hospitals, in some cases they're building hospitals, they're building plants to build vaccine. And then the government banks actually helped in building healthcare infrastructure in some of these countries. And they've also provided lending into local central banks in some of these countries. There are five key aspects of the Health Silk Road. Medicine, 
healthcare professionals, vaccines, hospitals, and lending. But it is vaccines that became the key focus. As the pandemic raged on in 2021, China became the largest supplier of vaccines to the developing world. This is remarkable because up until 2019, China played a minimal role in the global pharmaceutical industry, contributing less than 2% of medical goods procured by the United Nations. By contrast, neighboring India was responsible for 22% of such procurement and for 60% of global vaccine exports. Within one year of the pandemic, China was the leading exporter of vaccines to the world. With the Communist Party saying that it provided more than half of all the COVID-19 vaccines manufactured globally. Vaccine diplomacy became an international buzzword. Countries, China, Russia, European countries, the United States that produce vaccines, you start to see a push of them creating a supply, using it to you know, sustain their own markets and give their own people vaccination, but also starting to spread around the world. And that became known as vaccine diplomacy. The idea being, you know, countries are offering something to other countries um, as a way of kind of showing you know, their generosity, their magnanimity to these other countries. China is making an effort to deliver vaccines to mostly friends or countries in which it wants influence. Uh, and it is accompanying those vaccine sales mostly because despite what China says, the overwhelming majority of what it sends out is commercial sales. It has done very little to donate vaccines. But it accompanies all of that with a, a PR blitz, right? So the local Chinese embassy cuts ribbons and makes big announcements. They, they kind of demand that local officials go out to the airport and welcome them. And it seems all geared toward uh, improving China's influence and leverage as much as it is about actually delivering vaccines. But China took offense with the term vaccine diplomacy. Remember, there are also other dozens, uh, there are also dozens of other vaccines in developing process. So why have China's vaccines been singled out and branded as a diplomatic tool? But the whole narrative sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Do you remember the mass diplomacy? or money diplomacy. Every country promotes themselves and tries to win friends while interacting with others. But when it comes to China, there must be something fishy and hidden. I think this is a combination of a sour grape mentality dressed with ideological obsessions with a slight racist undertone. As debates around vaccine diplomacy swirled, so did disinformation. On the 29th of April, 2021, the European Union Information Analysis Division came up with a report. This division is an office studying disinformation campaigns, and it reports to the EU. The report states, the Russian and Chinese media were seeking to undermine trust in Western-made vaccines, EU institutions, and Western vaccination strategies. According to the report, Russia and China state media outlets amplified content on alleged side effects of the Western vaccines, misrepresenting and sensationalizing international media reports and associating deaths to the Pfizer vaccine. And it reinforces the promotion of Chinese and Russian vaccines as alternatives. These are some of the examples. Reports from Chinese state media claiming that caution is needed in mRNA vaccine. And Pfizer causes death. COVID-19 happened when US-China relations were at a particular low. And these tensions spread into everything that was happening, every single space. And so within that context, you saw a sort of clash. And clashes were happening everywhere. 
including in the information domain. And within the information domain, the push by China was to say, we're doing better than you in this. And you, West, are failing, and us, China, are succeeding. We also find ways of undermining your own narratives. And that's where the kind of disinformation comes into play. It's sort of throwing out ideas to confuse, to sow dissemination, to cause trouble and chaos, um, and to frankly undermine governments in the West in particular from within. It's dangerous. It is dangerous for China to engage in this kind of rhetoric, just because, like it was dangerous for the Trump administration to engage in unfounded rumor mongering about COVID in, in the early days, because all of it undermines trust in the credibility of authority. As misinformation swirled, the health silk road pushed ahead as countries started vaccinating their populations with Chinese vaccines. In a center in Jakarta, the vaccination drive is in full swing. In a nod to China's Health Silk Road, the country named Sinovac as its standard inoculating agent when it kicked off its national vaccine program. China was only one sources at the time. Uh, we also tried to find vaccines uh, cooperations from other countries as well, yeah? from Korea, for example. But at the time, according to my sources, it was the Chinese vaccine manufacturers that provided this very fast and quick response to the Indonesian uh, efforts to find vaccines for, for, for its people. Indonesia was one of the first in the world to kick off a vaccination program in January 2021. And for the first seven months, Chinese vaccines provided more than 85% of vaccine supplies. In a highly publicized event, President Jokowi took Sinovac in January to demonstrate it is safe. We can also see that China really exploited this news about Jokowi as among the first uh, world readers who get vaccinated with, with the Chinese vaccine, right? China really used this event through its media to promote the Chinese vaccine. So if you really see our vaccination program, for example, we have this tagline, right? Chinese vaccine is safe and halal. So of course, this tagline really have an impact uh, in the wider Muslim world. But the take-up rate in Indonesia was a disappointment in the early months. Hospitals continued to fill at alarming rates in the first half of 2021. In January, Indonesia announced plans to inoculate 67% of its 270 million people within 15 months. Five months after it started, it has inoculated a mere 8.5% of its population. A disaster unfolded. Indonesia has surpassed India's daily COVID-19 cases after reporting a record high of nearly 55,000 infections today. Indonesia is now said to be the new epicenter of the pandemic in Asia. There are many factors for low vaccination rates in July. Distribution methods, fake news, vaccine hesitancy, and sinophobia. Di lingkungan kami puluhan yang terkena COVID, enam yang meninggal, empat di rumah sakit dan dua di rumahnya. Salah satu korban yang meninggal di rumah sakit itu diantaranya ini rumahnya. 
Jadi sempat dirawat di rumah sakit selama 4 atau 5 hari. Tetapi kondisi yang penuh saat itu sehingga dia tidak dapat perawatan yang maksimal. Indonesia pandemi ini sangat-sangat berat. Kehidupan ekonomi menengah ke bawah itu hampir uh, lumpuh. Banyak tetangga saya yang sudah terkena PHK. Sementara untuk mencari kerja itu sangat susah. With so many COVID-19 cases in this neighborhood, many have taken the Sinovac jab when they were offered, but not Tarek and his family. Saya tidak mau divaksin Sinovac karena efikasinya masih rendah. Saya bersedia jika uh, saya bersedia dengan vaksin yang ada saat ini yang tingkat efikasinya di atas 80 persen. Saya sudah mendengar tentang diplomasi vaksin dari Cina dan itu sudah ya sekitar 6-7 bulan yang lalu. Makanya yang banyak beredar sekarang di Indonesia itu adalah vaksin dari Cina. Vaksin Sinovac dan Sinopharm. Nah, mungkin Ini bukan mungkin lagi karena kenyataannya memang seperti itu. Dosis yang ada saat ini kan vaksin dari negara tersebut. Besar kemungkinannya diplomasi tersebut berhasil. Tapi saat ini orang-orang terdidik di Indonesia sudah semakin yakin bahwa itu adalah hasil diplomasi yang tidak tepat sasaran. Nah, karena mereka tahu bahwa efikasi dari vaksin tersebut rendah. Makanya uh, banyak dari teman-teman saya yang sering uh, diskusi, sering membaca itu tidak mau divaksin dengan vaksin Sinovac. At December, only 37% of the Indonesian population has gotten their vaccinations. Experts point out many continue to have concerns around Chinese-made Sinovac. Anti-vaccine narratives are also rife on social media platforms. Anggota Komisi 9 DPR RI fraksi PDI Perjuangan, Ripka Ciptani, tegas menolak untuk vaksinasi COVID-19. Menurutnya, belum ada pihak manapun yang bisa memastikan keamanan vaksin asal Cina tersebut. Vaccination was not a good thing. Anak-anak saya coba jauhkan dari vaksin. Tidak ada masalah buat saya. Anak-anak saya tidak ada masalah. Kalau saya dengar ada syukur, saya tinggalkan secara pribadi. Dr. Yatun has been studying this vaccine chatter. Many Indonesians continue to be hesitant uh, or even refuse to get uh, vaccinated. You see that this hesitancy gets to be exploited and magnified uh, with the spread of all kinds of wild rumors, uh, conspiracy theories and other uh, types of fake news. Misinformation ranges from the unproven, like the vaccine contains pork gelatin, to the preposterous, that the vaccine has embedded microchips to control Indonesians. There are also the conspiracy theories. That the Sinovac vaccine is a global medical experiment by China, and that Indonesians are being used as guinea pigs uh, for this uh, experiment. And this rumor, you know, again, it starts as misinformation. It was based on the news that the Sinovac label, it contained the text only for cl clinical trial. This idea then became blown up as being this big medical experiment from China, you know, um, uh, being rolled out across uh, uh, the poor countries, the poor nations. And responding to these rumors, of course, you know, Biopharma, which is a company that produces and distributes the vaccine in Indonesia, it has clarified that, okay, only clinical trials only use the labels for, for its phase three kind of testing, and did actually not apply to the vaccines distributed to the public. But such official clarification from the government, from the, from the companies involved, it just falls on, on deaf ears once the rumor is out on, on social media. One of the misinformation is uh, when, yeah, when they share the news that even the Chinese uh, use Pfizer for its people. 
yeah, use American-made vaccine for its people. They try to promote these conspiracy theories that the Chinese have this hostile intention to, you know, to somehow just sell this second-rate Chinese-made vaccine. Why would Indonesians believe such fake news when their lives are at risk from infections? A major factor is Sinophobia, which has a long history here. In Indonesia, anti-Chinese uh, sentiment is rooted, so it has two, two different tracks, so to speak, uh, historically speaking. Uh, on the one hand, it's, it's actually a form of social je jealousy due to the prevailing notion, you know, still now that uh, Indonesians of Chinese descent, uh, that they dominate the national economy, and this is actually not correct. On the other hand, anti-Chinese sentiments have also been very strongly nurtured in the new order bred culture of anti-communism under the authoritarian president Suharto. So ever since the new order and up till now, this pitching of Islamic sentiment against anything that can be associated remotely with communism, it has frequently been exploited by certain political actors, including those opposed to the current Jokowi government. And indeed, Jokowi's political opponents often, you know, paint him as a communist, which he is uh, certainly not. And therefore, Jokowi's push uh, to get Indonesians inoculated with a vaccine made in a communist country, uh, it becomes a very easy target for, uh, for disinformation. There is a problem with this anti-China Chinese sentiment we have to also take into consideration the electoral dynamics in Indonesia. In Indonesia, it is common to see that if you try to win the elections, then you just uh, say that your rival is Chinese, your rival is communist. I want to say that electoral politics contributes to this anti-China Chinese situations. And if we go back to 2017. This kind of situations that was really happening in Jakarta gubernatorial elections when there was a Chinese Indonesians who ran for the Jakarta government positions at that time. They used this uh, identity politics to mobilize this anti-Chinese sentiment to win the election. The Indonesian government has jailed and fined those responsible for vaccine misinformation. It has also mounted a public awareness campaign. There's a lot of printed ads. There's a whole television show where celebrities are featured to, to you know, promote the vaccine to different parts of the population. It looks on the surface like Indonesia is winning the narrative battle, so to speak, around vaccination. But this is not to say that, you know, uh, these hoaxes are uh, gone. They just use different channels. They use different language so that, that they're not that easily detected by algorithms, for instance, uh, designed to detect fake news. And they move to uh, non-public social media platforms, WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a very dangerous uh, uh, channel for, for the spread of, of misinformation and disinformation. From the rumors that I heard, Kalau vaksin Sinovac itu mengandung babi dan itu saya khawatir ya, saya khawatir. Various opinion polls have flagged a rise in negative sentiments towards China in recent years. This despite the fact that China is Indonesia's second largest investor in 2020. Indonesia is just one of several countries in Southeast Asia which has been a major partner of China's Health Silk Road. Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar have also relied heavily on Chinese vaccines. In fact, Southeast Asian countries have gotten the lion's share of China's global vaccine donations. Data shows that out of the top 10 countries that China has pledged to donate to, five are in ASEAN. Southeast Asia is important for China for a number of different reasons. I think one of them is it's a very, you know, large region in terms of population. Um, it's one that's very young, it's growing. There's a massive market opportunity here. And it's a place that, frankly, China's always had a deep connection to. And so within that context, the kind of acting diplomacy narrative was quite important, I think, to China within this context, because this is an area that it, it, it can see as a center of contestation with the West. And it's a place that China feels it should be able to play a strong role and is playing a strong role. But though Chinese vaccine donation on the Health Silk Road is not insignificant, the vast majority of Chinese vaccines in the region are paid for. 
we should not ignore the fact that we buy vaccines from China. This, this is a very important uh, uh, misperception, especially from the Western world, that China provided Indonesia with free vaccines. No, we spend efforts to procure vaccines from China. We, 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 we do not get these vaccines from free. When you negotiate to purchase Sinovac or Sinopharm, you're negotiating primarily with Chinese officials. I mean, albeit through to, to get access to a state-owned company. And so when you buy Sinovac on the market, Beijing gets to say, hey, look, I just sent X number of vaccines to Indonesia, Cambodia, Brazil, whatever. The U.S. doesn't get to do that when you buy through Pfizer, buy through Moderna. You know, the, the Brits aren't claiming uh, that they're sending every dose of AstraZeneca. This is, is a way that China inflates and creates a false sense of generosity. It's really not there. China has sent 1.6 billion doses of vaccines abroad as of 16th of December. Of this, 126 million doses were donated. The U.S. has donated 276 million doses. We advocated that the EU, the USA, and China all sit down and try to figure out this together. But if absent that happening, then China has taken some very interesting moves um, to, to, to fill that gap. In the Philippines, China's Health Silk Road has been picking up speed since early 2021. 28th of February that same year was when the first shipment of Sinovac arrived. The first delivery of 600,000 doses was a donation from the Chinese government. The Philippines has begun its COVID-19 vaccination campaign. The Philippines officially started its COVID-19 vaccine rollout using Sinovac biotech vaccines donated by the Chinese government. This is the latest diplomatic gesture from the neighboring superpower. But we also see military diplomacy at work. 100,000 of the 600,000 vaccines that arrived on Sunday, a day before the rollout, were allocated for the Philippines Armed Forces, donated to them by the Chinese military. This donation from China signals the warming ties between Manila and Beijing. China has donated vaccines everywhere for the poor countries. I would like to thank and to travel to China even one day just to tell President Xi Jinping thank you. And I fly home. I, I want it to do personal because China has been good. Chinese vaccines arrived in the beginning of the year while Western nations were still focused on vaccinating their own populations. Many members of parliament questioned Duterte's over-reliance on vaccines from China. Terry Ridon is the former chief of the Urban Poor Commission under the Duterte administration. It is very important for us to be able to diversify from different sources of uh, vaccines because this is not just a health, question, health policy question, but this is also a diplomacy question. No? So if we would want to uh, develop our relations, for example, with the United States, with Great Britain, with the Russia, uh, and other providers, I think we have to be able to have a more or less a proportional supply uh, com coming from different areas. Debates erupted over the use of Sinovac as infection numbers continued to rise throughout the year. Survey results in May showed that 63% of Filipinos preferred an American vaccine, while China is at a far second at 19%. You would see reports where families upon families, individuals upon individuals, had been rejecting their vaccination dates because they had found out that it is not a Western brand vaccine. 
um, most certainly, uh, as a policy analyst, it is something that needs to be resolved. Because at this point, I would say that in respect of whichever vaccine, what is most important is for people to get vaccinated in the soonest time. President Duterte, frustrated by the slow pace of COVID-19 vaccinations, threatened people who refused to get vaccinated with jail or an injection of an anti-parasitic drug widely used to treat animals. Kung ayaw mo magpabakuna, ipaaristo kita. But for as long as you are here and you are a human being and can carry the virus, eh, magpabakuna ka. Otherwise, I will order all the barangay captains to have a tally of the people who refuse to be vaccinated. Kasi pag hindi yung may berbiktin na para sa baboy ang patira ko sa iyo. A major public health education campaign was launched. Dr. Alberto Herrera, city health officer of Marikina City, was one of those involved in the education campaign. Lack of information is the main uh, issue for vaccine hesitancy. If you give, give them a proper information, proper education about the importance of the vaccine, they will uh, accede to the vaccination program. The result of the clinical study ng Sinovac, so overall vaccine efficacy is 50.38%. For mild symptoms to develop once you get COVID, is 77%, meaning you prevent 77% to develop mild symptoms. 95% no, or 100% pwedeng hindi na mag-develop ng moderate to severe and even deaths yung mga nagka-COVID kung may sign of vaccine. So, mababa yun, sir. Diba? Is that probably the reason why marami ang natatakot Ayaw. sa sign of vaccine? Yun ang, yun ang reason kung bakit natat natatakot sila eh. Kasi ang overall efficacy nga nung isa is 50%, overall is 80%. There is, however, a major advantage of Sinovac compared to other vaccines. Pfizer and Moderna requires a special refrigerator with a negative 30 to negative 70 degrees centigrade temperature. So we have to purchase a refrigerator for that vaccine, while Sinovac you can put it at the body of an ordinary refrigerator because the temperature required by Sinovac is only plus 2 to plus 8 degrees centigrade. In terms of rolling it out in the vaccination center, it's easier. Whereas in Pfizer, we have to construct a special air-conditioned room. As infection numbers grew, many started to understand that any protection is better than none. China's Health Silk Road is getting mixed responses in Southeast Asia. Now you're seeing across the region uh, governments moving away from an over-reliance on Chinese vaccines. Thailand, which vaccinated heavily early on with both Sinovac and AstraZeneca, has now said that anybody who got one dose of Sinovac should get a second dose of AstraZeneca instead because of efficacy concerns. Even the Cambodians have said the same, that they're going to give out boosters that are non-Sinovac to those who got Sinovac. Malaysia has said that people need to get non-Chinese boosters. The Philippines and Indonesia haven't gone quite that far yet, but they both also have relatively low vaccination rates and aren't really in a position to bite the hand that feeds them just yet. Southeast Asia is very open to Chinese health diplomacy, a vaccine diplomacy, as it is, I think, open to Chinese investment in general. But I think it, it, it's, it's played very differently in different ways, in, in lots of sort of multi-layered and confused ways. 
you saw a lot of people die as a result of exposure to COVID-19 who had been vaccinated, in particular in the health sectors in parts of Indonesia and Vietnam. And so that caused a natural tension within these countries and a sort of anger towards China saying, why do we take this vaccine? Look at what it's done for us. It's only made the situation worse. And, you know, people are generally frustrated anyway against their governments and sort of China comes in the focus as a result. I think there's another side to this, which is curious, which is here in Singapore, where you saw some curious narratives playing out, where on the one hand, you saw a narrative spread through, you know, Chinese social media applications that are quite widely used here amongst the sort of older community in particular, where people were wary of Western vaccines because of rumors that they were here circulating through these sorts of Chinese media sources. Um, and so here you saw people actually actively wanting <laughs> Uh, the Chinese vaccine. As scientists from China race to produce more and newer vaccines, other aspects of the Health Silk Road make inroads. President Xi told ASEAN leaders that China pledges $1.5 billion in funds to help ASEAN nations with pandemic control and economic recovery for the next three years. China will also deliver 150 million COVID-19 vaccine doses to Southeast Asia and donate $5 million to an ASEAN pandemic fund. China's Health Silk Road has met with much controversy in Southeast Asia, but its implementation in Africa has been a little smoother. And the Health Silk Road there was built on another pandemic, Ebola. This man is one of many affected by the outbreak in Guinea. But there are teams from around the globe who are on the move or on high alert to contain this current outbreak. Treating the disease is complicated because it's rare, it's contagious and it's deadly. Amongst infectious diseases, the Ebola virus stands out as one of the deadliest. More than 60% of Ebola patients die. As Africa battled Ebola, China stepped in. Some of our friends were with us before Ebola, but left us because of Ebola. Some came because of Ebola and will leave us after Ebola. And others who have not been with us because of Ebola may come or return after Ebola. The government and the people of China have been with us before Ebola and have been with us in spite of Ebola and have committed to remaining with us even after Ebola. So, this indeed is a mark of true friendship. The Ebola experience is the precursor for what we outlined and what we saw in 2020, because it really did happen over a period of four or five different um, interventions. So awareness, then medical kits, then doctors arriving, if you will, and then it led to building a 100-bed hospital in Liberia in one month. And followed once they did get control of the crisis, they then had to provide monetary help to settle it afterwards. So that is the model that we're seeing now with China implying in its South Silk Road relative to COVID. And it was very important that China got that right for a couple of reasons. One, they had a lot of criticism over SARS. So they really jumped all over this to make sure they delivered, number one. Number two is it didn't, China has, you know, they're very, very clever 
Liberia was really an American state with an American constitution. And the American, uh, the American government did not provide a similar level of, of assistance to Liberia. China set up many links with different African hospitals during the Ebola pandemic. Annually, more than a thousand Chinese medical workers were working in African countries pre-COVID-19. So when the COVID-19 pandemic happened, China was able to mobilize quickly. At the beginning of the pandemic, it appeared that China seems to be the only um, superpower, so to speak, that was willing to help. And they did help because um, even before the vaccination, the vaccine came out, they were sending reliefs. I knew that Alibaba and so on, they sent things to Nigeria and the Chinese government also did the same. And it really happened in many African countries. Okay, trying to set up a hub for a cold storage hub in Ethiopia for the vaccines that are going to come. From January to June 2021, as the West practiced vaccine nationalism, it was China who exported vaccines to Africa. The Chinese government, they've done a lot. They've already delivered their vaccines to across the continent. And um, it forms an essential aspect of the, um, their greater health secret, which the Chinese are promoting. And within the context of COVID-19, it's quite impressive because impressive because this, the soft power diplomacy, it was being played out and played out very well. China was providing vaccines while the West was very reluctant and is still very reluctant till now. By December, across Africa, just about 10% of the population received one dose of the vaccine. The global neglect of Africa had dangerous consequences. As infections rise, a small group of Chinese doctors stay on in Africa, offering medical services beyond COVID-19 treatment. You feel net pain? Yes. Oh. How long? Oh, it has been long now. 16 months, 18 years. Uh, today, give you first acupuncture. We don't you worry. <laughs> now, you feel pain? All right. There are four doctors from China working in this hospital in Namibia. They have set up an acupuncture unit which continues to run during the pandemic. By 2021, China and Africa have established cooperation mechanisms with 41 hospitals across the continent. We are lucky to have people from China who are taking us on with this, helping us with acupuncture. And they, yeah, they are, they are helping us a lot. Besides acupuncture, the doctors from China are also tasked to share China's experience in fighting the pandemic with health authorities here. The Chinese medical team have been with us for a long time before the advent of COVID. And they have been working together with us. They are working within our situations and they have made a very good contribution uh, to the health sector services in the country and also when it came to the issue of the managing the pandemic, they have been one of our strongest allies in this fight. Chinese President Xi Jinping has said that vaccines should be made a global public good. And in September 2021, Algeria started producing Sinovac in the city of Constantine. Shut up. That's up. the North African country, in partnership with China, 
aims to meet domestic vaccine demand and export the surplus. In Pakistan, they also started producing the Chinese vaccine CanSinoBio, branding it as PakVac. China has taken some very interesting moves to fill that gap. And the biggest of those is the formation at the end of June of the vaccine, the BRI vaccine partnership, which uh, in, at, at launch is 29 countries. The goal of the exercise is to make sure the country has adequate vaccines. It's not dependent on issues of India, or it's not dependent on some ability to purchase uh, enough vaccines out of Pfizer or Moderna or some other player. You have adequate materials for vaccinations in your home country, manufactured in your home country, distributed in your home country. So you're not dependent on outside forces. You have control of your destiny with respect to vaccines, number one. Number two, you also have control of your destiny on pricing. Remember, this is a major business. So people that don't pay attention to this, it didn't exist as an industry a year ago. This year, my estimates are close to 100 billion revenue in one year. If you look at the next two or three years, this could be 200 billion to a quarter of a trillion dollar industry. Yes, and if you look at the margins in this business and the compensation being paid in this business to these executives, why should that be paid? To, uh, the money stays in the country. Besides vaccines, there's also been breakthroughs in China in the area of COVID-19 treatment. In December, China approved the country's first COVID-19 antibody treatment, developed by a Tsinghua University professor and his team. The treatment has shown an efficacy of 80% in cutting hospitalizations and deaths among high-risk patients in clinical trials. There Despite missteps, misinformation, and misunderstanding, China's Health Silk Road continues to play an important role in battling the pandemic. In this story that is still continually developing, all eyes will be on how the world's superpowers will respond.